ready. Ready? بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters in Islam It's a pleasure and honor to be here in the Uqba Mosque Foundation here in Cleveland, Maryland We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make this gathering one filled of benefit one filled of lots of rewards and one filled of lots of enlightening knowledge. What a better gathering than gathering upon the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal and trying to extract some of its deep and enlightening meanings. Inshallah, we will be discussing the advice of Luqman to his son. And inshallah, we will be starting right now and continuing throughout the entire weekend with many different beneficial sessions so first we'd like to request that everyone inshallah move close as possible as it was the tradition and manners and etiquettes of all of the great scholars of old and those trying to learn that you should try to get as close as possible to the teacher so that we can acquire the most benefit from uh, the knowledge that he is conveying to us. So first and foremost, we'd like to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for giving us the opportunity to come here, Cleveland, Maryland, and spend some time with all of you, wonderful community here. MashaAllah, you guys welcomed me with a very warm welcoming. Um, I felt that internally and also with the great uh, heat system here, mashallah as well. May Allah bless the community and increase them in goodness, alhamdulillah. But before we start, I just wanna remind us about the importance of coming into the masajid, the houses of Allah, the virtues of coming to the houses of Allah and learning together collectively to learn more about our deen. And specifically when that learning is attached to the book of Allah Azza The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he narrates to us in an authentic hadith. He says, the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he told us about some of the virtues and benefits that we get for coming to the masjids, the houses of Allah, to learn more about our deen. He said, there is no group from amongst the groups of people who gather in the houses of Allah and they recite the verses of Quran together. They learn and discuss the verses, the Quranic verses together, and they research them, and they learn about them, and they memorize them, and they recite them together, except that they will receive four things. The first thing that they will receive is that tranquility and peace will descend upon those gatherings. And this is something that I'm sure all of us feel when we even just come for the masjid for praying. But when we're here to learn and increase our knowledge about Allah Azza wa Jal and what the meanings of his speeches in the Quran, it only increases us more for sure, more humility, more knowledge, more tranquility, peace, and goodness. So that's the first benefit that we receive. The second benefit is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down his mercy upon these gatherings. We are overwhelmed by Allah's mercy when we start learning about Allah Azza wa Jal's deen, learning more about his Quran, learning more about the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The third virtue and benefit that we acquire from attending gatherings as such is that the angels come and they surround these gatherings. The angels hover above these gatherings and and some explanations of many of the scholars, they say that the angels actually descend and actually sit amongst those who are trying to acquire knowledge 
of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the last and most virtuous benefit that we can receive is that our names are mentioned in the heavens with the angels amongst Allah. Just how we see each other here in this gathering, Allah and the angels mention us in the heavens. So those are just some of the virtues and benefits of coming to the houses of Allah and learning about our deen. And this is a sign that Allah Azza wa Jal wants good for us. This is a sign that Allah Azza wa Jal has love for you. We could have been anywhere else on a Friday night. Could have been at the mall. Could have been at the park. Could have been out with your family, out on dinner. But Allah Azza wa Jal opened your heart and opened your minds to be successful. And to come and attend and learn something more about our deen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he told us, he said, Man bihi khayran, fi deen. That whoever Allah Azza wa Jal wants goodness for, he gives him understanding in the religion. So one of the tools and one of the techniques and one of the practices that we have to get used to and accustomed to, if we want to gain understanding of our deen, is sacrificing some of our time to come to the houses of Allah Azza wa Jal, to sit together, to learn as a community, to benefit from each other, to discuss things related to the Quran and discuss things related to the prophetic sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala make this journey that we're going to take through these beautiful verses of the Quran about Luqman's advice to his son. We ask Allah to make it beneficial, inshallah and something great and rememberable that we can all take home to our families, to our children, to our parents, and try to implement what we're learning this evening and over this weekend. So as you all know, the topic of our discussion is Luqman's advice to his son. Luqman's advice to his son. So why and when was this surah revealed? As we all know, there's an entire surah named after this man, named after Luqman. What is the significance behind Allah Azza wa Jal naming this entire surah after Luqman? Was he a prophet? Was he a messenger? Was he a wise man? Was he a student of knowledge? Was he a sheikh? What was his status? And then, this surah, Surah Luqman, was it a Meccan surah or was it a Madani surah? And what's the significance of it being a Meccan surah or Madani surah? What's the difference between a Meccan surah and a Madani surah? Okay, we're going to talk about that and discuss it a little bit. So, Surah Luqman was revealed in Mecca. Surah Luqman, it's the 31st surah in the Quran in regarding to the way that the Uthmani Mus'haf is arranged, okay? You can find it, the 31st surah, okay? But in relationship to the order in which it descended to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it is not the 31st surah. Actually, it was revealed after surah As-Safat and before surah As-Sabat. Okay, so it was revealed in the Meccan period. So when I say now, what is a Meccan surah and what is a Madani surah? Anybody have an idea? Okay, that's one opinion of the scholars. One opinion of the scholars is that all of the Meccan surahs were revealed in Mecca and all of the Madani surahs were revealed in Medina. That's why they call it Meccan or Madani. Any other opinions that anyone is familiar with related to why surahs were labeled Meccan surahs and Medini surahs? MashaAllah. Okay, Mumtaz, MashaAllah. One of the beautiful responses that we got from our brother was that the Meccan surahs, their themes and topics revolve around Tawheed revolve around the oneness of Allah, revolve around aqidah, revolve around 
stories of the prophets revolve around talking about the day of resurrection, revolve about mentioning what occurred to the previous nations and the previous prophets and the previous nations who denied the messages of their messengers, how they were destroyed. And the Medini Surahs speak about issues related to fiqh, jurisprudence, zakat, hajj, ramadan, uh, jihad, okay, these type of issues. So that's more related to the themes and topics related to Meccan surahs and Medani surahs. But first we want to determine, all right, well, what's a Meccan surah and what's a Medani surah? The strongest opinion related to the, uh, which is uh, mentioned that the scholars talk about, uh, is that a Meccan surah is any surah or any verse revealed during the Meccan period. Any surah or verse revealed in the Meccan period. How long was the Meccan period? How long did the Prophet Muhammad's home stay in Mecca? 13 years. 13 years in Mecca. So no matter if the Prophet was in Taif, Jeddah, Asfan, he traveled somewhere outside of Mecca, and it was revealed to him during that Meccan period, then that surah or that verse is considered a Meccan surah or Meccan verse. So that first 13 years, any verses or any surahs that were revealed in that first 13 years, they're considered what? Meccan surahs. So after the Muhammad made migration from Mecca to Medina, Medina he lived how many years? 10 years. So any verses or surahs that were revealed to the Messenger while he was in that Medini period, that last 10 years of his life would be considered a what? Medini surah. Whether it was in Khaybar, whether it was anywhere else where he went and traveled, as long as it was in that Medini period, then it was considered a what? A Medini surah or a Medini verse. And that brings us to another issue. Is it possible to have so this is related to what we call in Islam the sciences of Qur'an. You guys familiar with that? Ulum al-Qur'an. Sciences of the Qur'an. Which talks about the abrogating verses, the abrogated verses, verses that were revealed in Mecca, verses that were revealed in Medina, the different linguistic uh, features of different surahs. Meccan surahs have different language than in Medini surahs. Medini surahs have different themes than Meccan surahs, okay, topics. And why is it important to know the difference between the two, Meccan surahs and Medina surahs? How does it benefit me and you and our community here in Cleveland? Yeah. Ah. MashaAllah, it gives us context. It helps us see and realize and understand how Allah Azza wa Jal raised a nation of illiterate, ignorant people who had more social ills in their community than we have in our communities today. You think we have, you know, drug issues and alcohol and stuff like this? They would write poems about alcohol, just how we have rappers and things like that. They're all they're talking about is drinking 40s and Hennessy and blunts and things like that. Their poets, prior to the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in the, the, the days of Jahiliyyah, this is what they would make poems about. They say our alcohol is better tasting than your alcohol. Our women are more beautiful than your women. You know, we have so many women in this day and things like this. So the, the social ills that they were living were far greater and more worse than a lot of the things that we witness in our society here or very similar, okay? So, you know, we see women here. We know we have prostitutes here in, in the United States, right? But sometimes it might be hard to identify them. Prior to Islam, they would have flags on their houses indicating that whoever wants to come and visit them, they could come in and visit them. When they would make tawaf, the, the Quraysh, they would make people make tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Only the rich who had the, the money to buy the, the ihram would be able to wear ihram. Anybody else had to walk around the Kaaba naked. So the level of ignorance that the Arabs were living in prior to the sending of the Messenger وسلم, is a lot like the ignorance we see in many of our communities and many of our societies throughout the world. But how did Allah rectify a whole Arabian Peninsula? He started progressively. He started progressively. He didn't start off revealing the first verse, pray five times a day, right? 
or fast 30 days in Ramadan, or pay zakat, or fight jihad, or wear hijab. This didn't come until later on, until Allah Azza wa Jal raised and nurtured the Muslim community there. Got them to have that firm belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, that love of Allah, that hope in Allah, until then when Allah Azza wa Jal, He developed them and nurtured them to that stage, then it was easy for them to pray. It was easy for them to fast. They wanted to fast. They wanted to pray. So it gives us the proper context. When we understand Meccan surahs and Medani surahs and look at the language, the themes, it helps us understand the seerah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how Allah Azza wa Jal was progressive, progressively developing his community, starting off and prioritizing the most important things. What is the most important thing for somebody who accepts Islam? That he wears a turban and a thobe? Some brothers, they take shahada, here, here's your turban and thobe. Put that on the shelf for a minute. You believe in Allah, who's Allah? Where's Allah? What are his names? What are his attributes? How do you worship him? What's his rights that Allah has over you and you have over Allah? These are the first things. When the Prophet Muhammad sent Mu'ad to Yemen, what did he say? Call the people to? La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. If they agree to that, then tell them Allah has obligated upon them five prayers in the day. He didn't say start with prayer, start with zakat, anything else. Prioritizing our da'wah. Prioritizing our teaching of new Muslims. Prioritizing teaching of our children. If your child is seven years old and doesn't know anything about Allah Azza wa Jal, you're going to teach him to pray? You should order him to pray, but does he know who he's praying to? So he comes first, then prayer. He has no concept about Allah Azza wa Jal, the prayer is not going to benefit him at all. It's just going through the movements. Like he's doing exercise or yoga or something. Who's he praying to? Why is he praying? That's the importance of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So understanding Meccan and Medani surahs, it helps us understand the context of what was revealed to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how to prioritize our understanding of the deen and prioritize our da'wah when we want to teach others or we want to help others learn about our deen, especially here in the United States. If you were going to give da'wah to a non-Muslim, what would you start with? What's the conversation you would have? What's the opener? Hi, how are you? Okay, after that. Have you ever thought about your purpose here on earth? Have you ever thought about why you were created? Ask some of your colleagues in college or at school or at work, why are you here? Oh, I don't know, you know, just to work and enjoy my life and get married and have children and then retire and then die, basically. Ask a Muslim, why are you here? What's your purpose in life? Worship Allah. Allah didn't create the jinn and the, and the mankind except to worship Allah alone. We have a, a simple, clear cut answer. Many of our non Muslim neighbors here in America, they don't know the answer to that question. So, who is it upon to help them and assist them to understand their purpose in life? So, you would teach them about Allah before you teach them, hey, you got to come pray, man. Prayer is good. Why don't you fast with us? Fast in Ramadan and stuff like that. No, man, wait up, wait. Get them to understand and realize there's a creator and that creator deserves to be worshipped. That's the first thing. So understanding Mecca and Medani surahs helps us prioritize our da'wah. Prioritize our message and our invitation. Okay? So this surah, the scholars, they mentioned that this surah was called Surah Luqman because Luqman's name is mentioned. Luqman's name is mentioned in this surah. Okay? Who was Luqman? Luqman was a very noble, wise individual. Some scholars have mentioned that he was from the people of Jerusalem during the time of Dawood and our prophet Sulaiman. Other scholars mentioned that Luqman was from Ethiopia or Nubia. Anybody know where Nubia is? Where is Nubia? Southern Egypt, Northern Sudan. 
southern Egypt, northern Sudan. I think you would call that what's the, a swan or uh, okay, close it from Sudan. So Nubia, that's northern Sudan, southern Egypt. So some of the scholars they say that that's where he was from, Luqman. And Luqman, what was he granted? What did Allah Azza wa Jal give him? As Allah mentions in the verses we're going to study, that Allah Azza wa Jal granted him wisdom. Allah granted him hikmah. Allah granted him wisdom. Allah didn't grant him wahi. Okay, Allah didn't grant him revelation, but Allah granted him wisdom. So somebody can be wise and not receive revelation. Or somebody can receive revelation and be wise at the same time. So we don't have any mention in the Quran or in the Sunnah that Luqman was one who Allah Azza wa Jal chose to be a prophet and messenger and that he actually received revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. So he was granted wisdom and there's many narrations that come in many of the historical books that he was granted wisdom because of his self-restraint. Because of his self-restraint and he liked to sit and contemplate and reflect. It's been narrated that many people would come up to Luqman and they would try to talk with him and converse with him and discuss issues with him, but he wouldn't respond. He would be very quiet and he would say, I am thinking, I'm contemplating, I'm pondering. He was somewhat of a very quiet individual or maybe somebody who would be considered in our damn time, maybe he's an introvert, he's more focused on what's inside, he's very observant to his surroundings and the situations in his community. Okay? It was also narrated about Luqman that he was never seen to laugh. He was a very serious individual. He was a very serious individual and if he opened his mouth, then he was extremely eloquent. He spoke with a little bit of words, but it had great meaning. Very similar to who? To the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was sent with the what? Jawam al kalam With the most concise and comprehensive speech. Where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would speak with short words, but it would have great meaning. An example of the Jawam al kalim of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is when a man came to him and he said, O Sini, O Messenger of Allah, give me advice, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad summed up all of the advice in just two words, which is the root for many of the problems and issues that people face on a daily basis. La taghdab. Don't get angry. Tell me something else. Don't get angry. Tell me something else. Don't get angry. He repeated it three times. So think about many of the problems that we face in our daily life with your wife, with your children, with your employer, with your employees, with your brothers in the masjid, outside the masjid, with your sisters in the community. Many of them can all be extinguished if we do not become angry. Stress, anxiety, nervousness, fear, worry, all of these things a lot of them are rooted in what? Being angry at something or someone or a situation. And that's why the Messenger summed it up in that, those two words. Don't get angry. So it was mentioned, he was, Luqman was mentioned in the Quran, as we mentioned, the whole surah was named after him. So anytime Allah Azza wa Jal or the companions have a name for a surah, okay, then this individual or this topic is something significant, something that we should pay attention to. Like for example, other surahs in the Quran, Al-Baqarah. Why was it called Al-Baqarah? Because of the mention of Al-Baqarah, right? In Bani Israel. Ali Imran, because of the mention of Ali Imran. Sajda, for example, because Sajda. For example, uh, Al-Nahl. The surah of Al-Nahl. Nahl is what? Bees. Allah well, mentions bees in the Quran. We have science in the Quran. Biology in the Quran. Nature mentioned in the Quran. So why was that surah called the Nahl? Because of the mentioning of the bees and the, the miraculous honey that they make, which is shifa for human beings. So this surah was called Luqman after 
Luqman's mentioned in, in that surah. So, were the Arabs of that time familiar with Luqman? How did they hear Luqman if he wasn't mentioned in the previous books? They weren't, if he wasn't mentioned in the Torah, or wasn't mentioned in the Injil, or wasn't mentioned in the Zabur? Where did the Arabs learn about Luqman? First of all, where did the Prophet Muhammad learn about Luqman? From Allah Azza wa Jal, from revelation revealed to him. So the way that Allah Azza wa Jal would address the Arabs of that time and address the people of that time in the Meccan period was in a way and strike examples and relate to them stories that they could relate to, that they were familiar with, to awaken their understanding, to awaken their memory that they maybe had forgot about the story of Luqman and how wise he was and the advice that he had given to his son. And on one occasion, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're going to come to learn about this, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was discussing some issues related to creed with the companions. And he said, the verse in Surah An'am, he was reciting to them, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُحْتَدُونَ The Messenger وسلم, on one occasion, he was explaining to the companions about Iman, about the importance of protection and security. How Allah, he says, it is those who do not mix their faith with dhulm. Those who do not mix their Iman with dhulm, then those will acquire and attain complete guidance and those people will attain and acquire complete security. So when the companions heard that verse, they became worried, they became frightened. They went to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, who from amongst us does not oppress oneself? You said it is those who do not oppress themselves, those who believe and do not mix their faith with oppression, then they will receive complete guidance and complete security. How can somebody be free from oppressing others? Everybody oppresses everybody else. Something we can't avoid. So he told the companions, he says, haven't you heard the statement of Luqman to his son when he said to him, Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah, Oh my son, do not commit shirk with Allah. Do not associate partners with Allah. For indeed, associating partners with Allah is a great form of oppression. So in this occasion, the Messenger وسلم, he explained the word dhulm in the previous verse in Surah Al-An'am. He explained the word dhulm to mean what? Worshipping other than Allah or falling into shirk that can take somebody out of the folds of Islam. And that is the worst form of oppression. And may Allah protect us all from a shirk. So the Arabs during the time of the Messenger وسلم, they were familiar with many of the stories of the people of old. Because remember Mecca, during the Meccan period, who used to come to Mecca? Mecca was the center of trade for everybody. They would come from Yemen, stop in Mecca, sell their goods there, and then go up to Sham. And then come back down from Sham, stop in Mecca, and go to Yemen. So that was the trade route for many of the traders. They would also come from Northern Africa as well, from Egypt, from Morocco, from Libya. At that time, it wasn't known as these countries. It was just the Maghrib al-Arabi. Okay? So they were constantly passing through Mecca. Mecca was a center of trade. Mecca was a center of commerce. So, of course, you had people who remained upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which was what? Islam, Tawheed, Islamic monotheism. But then you had people from other faiths as well coming. People from Persia passing through. They were Zoroastrians or Magians. They were fire worshippers. And then you had Christians. And then you had Jews who were all passing through Mecca to do business. So, they would intermingle with each other relate stories and narrations and things like that, poems and things like that, that they used to hang on the Kaaba, the Mu'allaqat, as-sab'a, the 
famous lines of poetry that they used to hang on on the Kaaba, and that's how narratives would transmit and stories of old would transmit from one community to the next. When they would come to Mecca, they would make their tawaf, right? Their tawaf was different than our tawaf is today. And they would still circumambulate, but they would do so, some with clothes off, right? Because they couldn't afford to wear the ihram. But there were idols also in the vicinity of the Kaaba as well, over 360 idols that people would worship. They had left the, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Arabs, they were familiar with the story of Luqman and his advice to his son, okay? And he was considered to be somebody who was very wise amongst the people of Quraysh, amongst the people of the tribesmen and the relatives of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam. Some of Luqman's wisdom that has been mentioned in some of the books of history is that Luqman, he worked as a carpenter. He worked as a carpenter. Some say that he was a servant to some, uh, and he had a, a master, but he was a very uh, skilled carpenter. And one day his master had ordered him, he says, I want you to go and slaughter a goat. I want you to go and slaughter a goat and bring to me the best and most delicious parts of the goat. Most of us nowadays, the most delicious part of the goat would be what? Either the shoulder or the thigh for the most of us, right? So Luqman, when he came back to his master, what did he bring and pre present to his master? He brought to him the tongue and the heart. So the master asked him, he said, don't you find anything better than this? Luqman, he said, no. Then after some, some time, the master ordered him again. He says, slaughter another goat and throw away the most disgusting two parts of the goat. So Luqman slaughtered the goat and what did he throw away? He threw away the tongue and threw away the heart. So the master said to him, he says, I ordered you to bring me the most delicious parts of the goat and you brought me the heart and the tongue. And I ordered you to throw away the most disgusting parts and you threw away the tongue and the heart. How can this be? It's a contradiction. How, how can they be the most sweetest and the most disgusting parts? So Luqman, he said, this is from his wisdom. He said, nothing can be more pleasing and delicious than these, the heart and the tongue, if they are good. And nothing can be more malicious and disgusting than these two, if they are bad and used for evil. How many hadith do we have from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talks us about the importance of purifying the heart, the importance of paying attention to the tongue. Every morning that we wake up in the morning, the tongue, it orders the rest of the limbs. It orders the rest of the limbs of the body and it says, fear, uh, fear me. The tongue addresses all the rest of the limbs and says, fear me, because whatever you do is a manifestation of what is in your heart. And it orders the heart as well. Don't let out everything that's in your heart upon me. So if the heart is sound, the rest of the body is sound. The statements, the actions are good and pure. This is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told us. He says, Inna fil jasadi mudra. Indeed, there is a piece of flesh in the body. Ida salaha, salaha jasadu kulluhu. Ida fasada, fasada jasadu kulluhu ala wahi al qalb. He said, Indeed, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If this piece of flesh is sound and healthy, then the rest of the body is sound and healthy. If this piece of flesh is corrupt and sick and ill, then the rest of the body is sick and ill. Indeed, this piece of flesh is the heart. So Luqman knew from even a young age and was filled with wisdom and hikmah of how to give a lesson to his master. Even though his master may have been over him and ordering him and, you know, maybe punishing him and disciplining him and things like this, he still, he still sent to him a very beneficial message that he could 
benefit from. So, Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions in the beginning of these verses that we're going to be studying, He says, After A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al Rajeem, Walaqad Aatayna Luqman Al Hikmata, and Ashkur Lillah, Wamay Yashkur Fa Inna Ma Yashkur Li Nafsi, Waman Kafara Fa Inna Allah Ghani Yun Hamid. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the 12th verse of Surah Luqman, He says, And certainly we have given wisdom to Luqman, saying, Be grateful to Allah, and whoever is grateful, he is only grateful for his own self. And whoever is ungrateful and unappreciative, then surely Allah Azza wa Jal is self sufficient and praised. So as we mentioned, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in this verse that Luqman was given hikmah. So what is hikmah? What is wisdom? What is the wisdom that Luqman was given? What is hikmah in our day and time? What is hikmah during the time of the Prophet Muhammad What is al-kitab wal-hikmah when it's mentioned in the Quran? The Messenger وسلم, he told us, he says, whoever has been given hikmah has been given a great thing. Nothing better than hikmah. What is hikmah? What are some of the definitions of hikmah that you've heard from the scholars? In order to have hikmah, prior to that you need to have knowledge. Either knowledge based upon texts from the Quran and Sunnah or knowledge based upon your observations through your senses that you utilize on a daily basis, experience, life experience, job experience, social experience, experience with kids, experience with spouses, experience with employers, employees, everybody you come into contact with. All of these are ways of acquiring what? Hikmah. Ways of acquiring Hikmah. So Hikmah, according to many scholars, it means to use your knowledge in the right place, at the right time, in the right situation, with the right individual. So you may have a storehouse of knowledge but because you lack hikmah, you may not be able to convey that knowledge properly. Instead of attracting people, you push them away because of a lack of hikmah, lack of wisdom. So yes, hikmah can be given to you by Allah Azza wa Jal, but many times hikmah comes through trial and error. You learn from your mistakes. You learn from your experiences. You learn from your shortcomings. Maybe when you deal with your children, maybe I shouldn't have been so harsh. Maybe I shouldn't have raised my voice. Maybe I shouldn't have been so lenient. And subhanAllah, that's something that we as parents, we as brothers in Islam, sisters in Islam, even children in Islam, that many of us make mistakes. In how to implement our knowledge, when to implement it, when not to implement it, when to be quiet, when to talk. So all of these things come through. First, it comes from Allah Azza wa Jalla. If Allah gives somebody hikmah, that's a great gift from Allah Azza wa Jalla. But it also comes from our experiences and our dealings with other people, other situations, trial and error. So many of the scholars have mentioned that when wisdom in the Quran, we have many verses in the Quran that Allah says, that uh, he has revealed the Al-Kitab Wal-Hikmah that he has revealed to the Messenger وسلم, the book and the Hikmah so when the book Al-Kitab is joined with Al-Hikmah in the Quran the scholars have mentioned that the meaning of Al-Hikmah here is what? the Sunnah that the Messenger وسلم, was given the Quran and given the Sunnah which are both forms of Revelation, which are both forms of revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. So that is the meaning of Al-Hikmah. So 
Allah he said in that verse that indeed we have given Luqman hikmah and then Allah right after that what did he say? What's the first type of hikmah or the first level of hikmah that Allah talks about giving Luqman in that verse, in verse number 12? وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ أَشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ So one of the first manifestations of having hikmah, having wisdom, is to be grateful and appreciative of who? Of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because being grateful and thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal is a means to keep the blessings and the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal continuously falling upon you in ways that you can't even imagine. And when you stop being grateful to Allah and appreciative to Allah Azza wa Jal, this is a means to cut off the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is what Allah he says in the Quran. He says, if you want an increase in blessings, then you should give shukr to me. in shukartum, if you give thanks to me, if you show shukr, if you show gratefulness, if you show appreciation to me, then I will increase you in all good things. But if you are ungrateful, then indeed Allah Azza wa Jal, right, is free from them and Allah is all independent and in no need of them. So one of the first factors in acquiring and attaining wisdom like the beloved wise man Luqman is to be grateful and appreciative to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is what our Messenger وسلم, constantly advised us to do. What is a way that we can be grateful for what we have? Should we look to those who have more than us? Bentleys and 10 room mansions and 8,000 square foot houses and a private jet and uh, you know billions of dollars worth of real estate and uh, polo jackets and sneakers and is this who we should look to to become more grateful and appreciative to Allah Azza or should we look to a different fi'a of people what did the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam advise us to do he said don't look to those who have more than you don't look to those who have more wealth than you. Don't look to those who have more children than you. Don't look to those who have better health than you. Don't look to those who have more houses than you. Don't look to those who have more investments than you. Look to those who have less than you. Because when you look to those who have less than you, then you're more appreciative to what Allah Azza wa Jal has given you. If you're constantly looking at those who have more than you, you're constantly in a race, competing. I need more, I need more. I have a million, I need 10 million. I have 10 million, I need 100 million. I have 100 million, I need 500 million. I have five clinics, I need 10 clinics. You're constantly in competition. And this is what the Prophet Muhammad told us. He says, Talibani la yishba'ani. He says, two type of seekers will never become content or satisfied. Talib al-dunya wa talib al -ilm. He said two types of seekers, those who seek students, I guess you can say, or those trying to seek things out, will never be satisfied. The one seeking dunya, he'll never be satisfied, no matter how much dunya he has. And the one seeking religious knowledge and getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jal because he tastes the sweetness of learning knowledge, learning more about Allah, extracting these benefits from pondering and reflecting over the Quran or pondering and reflecting over the Sunnah that we didn't really pay attention to. And this is the benefit of having gatherings such as this where we're discussing some of the benefits of these verses and some of the things that we can extract from them. So, shukr is one of the greatest manifestations of wisdom that Luqman was given. So, how does one give shukr to Allah? What are some ways that we give shukr to Allah Azza wa Jalla? Being obedient to Allah, alhamdulillah. What else? What are some other ways we can be, show shukr to Allah Azza wa Jal? Huh? Pray, alhamdulillah. Actions of worship. Prayer, zakat, fasting. What else? Huh? Staying away from haramat.
What else? Reading Quran. Allah Akbar. Excellent answer. Dawah. Giving Dawah. That's one of the greatest ways of thanking Allah for guiding you to Islam. Is teaching somebody else. That's an obligation. Convey upon me even if it is one verse. How do you show Allah that you're grateful being Muslim? Invite somebody else to Islam. Show him what you learned. Show him how you benefited from the community. So, can you give shukr with your wealth? How? Zakat. What else? Sadaqah. Can you give shukr with your limbs? How? You said praying. What else? Ah, every step to the masjid. Shukr. What else? Huh? Jihad for the sake of Allah. What else? Hajj. What else? How about... How about eating healthy? What would be the reason? To preserve my body, to make me a better worshiper of Allah, to make me stronger in Qiyam al to make me stronger fighter for the sake of Allah, to make me a stronger reciter in Ramadan, to make my memory stronger. That's why I drink ginger or eat raisins and things like that, right? What about doing push-ups? If your intention is right, doing push-ups, right? Why? Because you're strengthening your body so that you can worship Allah Azza wa Jal better. Swimming, riding horses, archery, shooting, all of that. If your intention is sincere that you're doing it to be a better worship of Allah Azza wa Jal, this is a way of giving Allah shukr and being appreciative and grateful to the na'am that Allah Azza wa Jal blesses. Yeah. No. Eating. No. Right? Don't kill yourself, right? Do not lead yourself to destruction by your own hands. Don't overeat. What did the Prophet Muhammad say? He said a third for food, a third for air, a third for water. Eat luqaymat hatta yaqumna sulbuh. Right? The Prophet Muhammad would just eat small bites, just enough for his back to straighten out, not to like this, like a lot of us eat, may Allah help us all, right? So, a way of giving shukr is also staying away from the muharramat, avoiding the things which are haram, like the brother was mentioning, avoiding haram food. How many of us we pay attention to, is this meat zabiha? But we forget about how we earned the money to buy the zabiha. We bought the zabiha with riba. Allah. <laughs> Serious, right? Or we bought the zabiha with drug money. We bought the zabiha with uh, cigarette money. We bought the zabiha with alcohol money. We bought the zabiha with uh, money based upon lying or cheating or deceiving somebody about our merchandise. We sold somebody a lemon, a, ca a car that broke down after three days. We said the car was mint. Now we're worrying about is the meat zabiha or not zabiha. That's giving shukr to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Using the tools that Allah has given you in a permissible way. That's shukr. That's the best way to give shukr. And the more you do this, be obedient to Allah and avoid acts of disobedience, then Allah will increase you in that those blessings that He's given you. Worldly benefits as well as religious benefits. He'll give you tawfiq, He'll give you success to attend gatherings and lectures such as this so you can increase in understanding of the deen. Now, what are some ways we can give shukr? Okay, we talked about that. With our hearts. Can we give shukr to Allah with our hearts? How? Huh? Establishing tawheed in our heart. What else? Contemplating. How do you contemplate on Allah? Quran, what else? No, but like contemplating where I'm just sitting in a park. Think about his name, Athel. Nature, his signs. Look at the magnificent creation here. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the clouds, made the sun, made the trees, the squirrels, the birds, the fish, the water, my lungs, my eyes. I can see this far. I can touch and these are all ways of contemplating a tadabbur, right?
right? Tadabbur ayat al kawm things in the creation. These are ways of getting closer. This is ibadah. This is worship. Because it leads you to doing shukr of Allah. It leads you to thanking Allah. Oh Allah, thank you for making me Muslim. And I realize how magnificent and great you are and how perfect you've made this creation. How accurate and precise you've made the seasons and made the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun and the moon cycle. It's the same sign every month. We know when it's the 13th, 14th, and 15th of every month. All we got to do is look in the heavens and the moon is full. Signs from Allah. Contemplating. So that is one of the ways that we contemplate and reflect in our hearts. And actions of the hearts are even more important than actions on the limbs. A'mal al qulub A lot of us, when we talk about shirk or read books about associating partners with Allah, we think that, okay... He was supplicating to other than Allah. He had his hands up. He was, you know, supplicating to the grave or supplicating to this saint and things like that. Or somebody went to the grave and prostrated to the grave and things like that. What about if somebody in their heart, they believe, that they didn't do any apparent actions or statements. They believe in their heart that an individual on the other side of the world has the ability to harm him physically harm him and he's scared of that person more than he is afraid of Allah Azza wa Jal khawf fear or love you love something in your heart more than you love Allah Azza wa Jal which makes you give precedence to that thing or that man or that woman or that whatever it is more than being obedient to Allah. You give that precedence to praying. You delay your prayer because of that thing. You love that thing more. You love that thing more than making Hajj. You love going to the Bahamas every year. That's precedence over making Hajj for Allah and fulfilling that fifth pillar in Tawheed. So somebody can leave the fold of Islam just because of a belief in the heart. It doesn't necessitate that it comes outwardly on the limbs or upon the tongue because iman is belief in the heart actions in the limbs and statements on the tongue increases with good decreases with bad it's not just actions on the limbs but it's because he prays the munafikin used to pray right the hypocrites they used to pray in the time of the prophet Muhammad وسلم, but in their heart was what kufr nifaq hypocrisy so Pay attention to the affairs of the heart. He said, if the heart is clean, the heart is pure, then it's going to manifest outwardly into your limbs, into your statements. You're not going to lie. You're not going to cheat. You're not going to swear. You're not going to be disrespectful to your parents, to your elders, to your youth, to your children, to your employer, to your employees, to your wife, to your husband. All of it is rooted where? In your heart. That's why if you see somebody, they have a problem with swearing or cursing or lying and things like that, focus on, brother, you need to, we need to work on some purification of the heart. Let's go read some Quran. Let's go read the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Let's go read some hadith. Let's focus on purifying the heart before you start addressing the problem that they have with their tongue. Because if you fix the heart, then that's the root to all these deficiencies and mistakes that we have. So, Luqman's advice, as we mentioned, it's in Surah Luqman, it's chapter 31 in the Quran, verses 13 through 19. 13 through 19. So how many verses is that? Seven verses, right? Seven verses. So what was the way that the companions of the Messenger وسلم, used to learn the Quran? Because that's what we want to get back to. We want to get back to the way companions, the tabi'een, the first three generations, the great imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad. We want to learn the deen and learn the Quran and sunnah the way they did. How did they learn the Quran? Ten verses at a time. So what they would do, they would learn ten verses at the time. And they wouldn't go on past ten verses until they had memorized them, understood the syntax, the nahu and the sarf related to those verses, 
understood the context of those verses, understood where those verses were revealed, understand where, what kind of surah were those verses revealed, and the themes, the topics of those verses, the causes of revelation of those verses, uh, the ahkam, the rulings and legislations related to those verses, then after memorizing them and understanding all of the ahkam related to them, then they would move on to 10 more new verses. And they wouldn't move on to 10 more new verses until they had implemented those verses into their behavior, into their manners, into their household, into their interactions with their children, into their interactions with their parents, into their interactions with their community, their brothers and sisters, and everybody they come into contact with. Because the Quran is a book of what? It's not a book of memorization. Right? Right? The Quran wasn't just revealed for us to memorize and you know run around with parchments on our back like a donkey. No. The Quran is a book of amal. The Quran is a book of action, implementation. Allah wages war against somebody who engages in riba. You just take that as like something simple. If Allah says he engages in war against somebody, doesn't that scare you? Doesn't that scare you? When Allah He says, we, I, wage war against somebody who is involved in evil. If Allah is your enemy, who, who can save you? Nobody from amongst the creation at all. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن صنا حي على صنا حي على الفنا So, continuing on, our advice of Luqman to his son. We mentioned that the methodology of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is that they would learn 10 verses at a time. They wouldn't rush into memorizing the Quran. They wouldn't try to memorize the Quran without understanding its meanings. Okay, they would take their time. Where it's mentioned that Umar ibn al-Khattab, how many years was it mentioned that he took to memorize Surah al-Baqarah? Ten years, eight years, in some narrations, ten years. Some of us, we memorize the whole Quran in two years. 
But when we inquire about, well, brother, give me some insight as to the rulings and legislations of this surah or these verses. I don't got it. And this is what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he said, in the end of the times, in the end times, you will find the Qur'an a lot. He says the reciters of the Qur'an will be many, but the fuqaha will be qaleel. But those who understand the Qur'an will be few. He said in our time it was different. Our time, those who understood the Qur'an were many, but the Qur'an were few. So this goes back to priorities. Don't rush your children to memorize Qur'an. If they're, mashallah, getting a good pace in memorizing, make sure that they're understanding what they're memorizing. We're not saying don't tell your kids to memorize Quran. No, have them, encourage them to memorize Quran. We need hafa. But at the same time, help them to understand the meanings of the Quran. And what does it demand from me in relating to, to my actions, to my behavior? How many of those memorize Quran but they smoke? Brothers in Dubai, I was in Saudi, I mean, May Allah help us all. We all have shortcomings and mistakes, but Quran isn't just you know having a melodious voice and being able to recite and recall it whenever you want. No, the Quran needs to have an effect on your heart, an effect on your behavior, and your demeanor, and your etiquette, manners. So Luqman's advice to his son. We're going to read the verses in Bidnillah, and then inshallah move on to our uh, our discussion inshallah and our lecture topic. So. Allah Azza wa Jalla he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِإِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيْ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنْ أَشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمُصِيرِ وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمْ فَلَا تُتِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبَهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنَّهَا إِنْ تَكُمْ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ فَتَكُونْ فِي سَخْرَةٍ أَوْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَأْتِ بِهَا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَطِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانهى عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور وَلَا تُسَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ وَاقْسِدْ فِي مَشْيَكْ وَاغْضُدْ مِنْ سَوْتِكْ إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَسَوْتٌ حَمِيرٌ So Allah Azza wa Jal, the translation of the meaning is And remember when Luqman said to his son, when he was advising him, Oh my son, do not worship others along with Allah. Verily, joining others in worship with Allah is a great zulm, is a great zulm, is a great wrong and oppression indeed. And we have enjoined upon mankind to be dutiful and good to his parents. His mother bore him in weakness, in hardship, and more weakness upon hardship, and more weakness upon hardship, and his weaning is in two years. Give thanks to me, to Allah Azza wa Jal, and to your parents, and to me is the final destination and final return. But if they, meaning here your parents, if your parents strive with you, to make you worship someone other than Allah Azza wa Jal, and that which you have no knowledge, then do not be obedient to them and behave with them in this world in a kindly fashion and follow 
the way of him who turns to me in repentance and in obedience, then to me will be all of your return. And I shall tell you about what you used to do. O oh, my son, if it be anything equal to the weight of a grain of a mustard seed, and though it be in a rock, or in the heavens or in the earth, Allah will surely bring it forward. Verily, Allah is subtle in bringing out that grain, well acquainted with its place. O oh, my son, establish the prayer, perform the prayer, and enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And bear this with patience, whatever befalls you. Verily, these are some of the important commandments that Allah Azza wa Jal has given. And do not turn your face away from people with pride or arrogance, nor walk in insolence and arrogance and pride throughout the earth. Verily, Allah does not like the arrogant boaster. And be moderate or show no insolence in the way that you walk and lower and humble your voice. Verily, the happiest, the worst of all voices is the braying of the donkeys. So this is the translation of the meanings of these verses that we are going to be going over in this weekend. So if we stop at the first verse here, we find that Luqman started off with the most important thing for a Muslim, as we talked about prioritizing our call, prioritizing our invitation, prioritizing our understanding. He said, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِإِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيْ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ And remember when Luqman said to his son, O oh my son, do not join others in worship with Allah. Indeed, doing so is a great oppression. So what does Allah mean here when He says, Ya'idhuhu? What does Allah say when He talks about Luqman that He gave him a mo'idah? What is a mo'idah? What is the difference between the mo'idah and the nasiha or the wasiya? What is the difference between the three different words? And why did Luqman use that word in particular? Or why did Allah Azza wa use that word Mo'idha to describe the way that Luqman advised his son? When you think about a Mo'idha, if you come across it in the Quran and Sunnah, what do you come across in the Quran and Sunnah? What is coupled and joined with a Mo'idha? Hikmah, okay, what else? Do we have any hadith where the companions talk about the Prophet Muhammad gave us a mo'idah? Wa'adhan al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mo'idatan wajilat minha qulub wa dharafat minha al-ayun. The Prophet Muhammad, the companions, they said, one day the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gave us a mo'idah. And the result of that mo'idah was what? It affected our hearts, it softened our hearts, it woke our hearts up and it caused us to cry. It caused us to shed tears. So a mo'idha is something that awakens your heart, reminds the person who may have been neglectful, reminds the person who may have been in a slumber or inattentive, not paying attention, not cautious, about their deeds, their actions, or their statements. So the word mo'idha, it comes from the word wa'ath. Wa'ath, okay? Wa'ath means to admonish or rebuke or scold someone or reprimand someone, okay? And it also is joined with something that softens your heart, that softens your heart and awakens your heart. And the scholars, they say, al mu'idha is zajrun muqtarinun bi takhweef. Okay, it's like an admonition which is joined with creating fear in the one that you want to admonish or rebuke or advise or uh, scold. 
Okay. Another definition is is reminding somebody about good things which softens their hearts. So this is what Uthman wanted to do with his beloved son. He wanted to give him an admonishment. He wanted to give him a reminder, something that would waken up his heart. Most likely he was at a young age where he was maybe busying himself with playing a lot, joking around a lot, not being serious a lot. And maybe he was reaching that age of puberty where now maybe he was seven years old, ten years old, as we'll come to learn, where Luqman advises him, establish the prayer. So we know that in the Sharia of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the Prophet, he said, order your children to pray when they are seven and spank them if they don't at the age of 10. So most likely, and Allah knows best, it was very similar amongst the other prophets and messengers in relation to their children. When would you order your child to pray? Between the ages of seven and 10 years old. So most likely, Luqman's son, he was coming of that age where he was getting ready to be of those who would have to perform the obligatory prayer. So another thing that sticks out in this beautiful verse is, why did Luqman, when he addressed his son, Ya Bunay? Why didn't he say, Ya Walid? Or, Ya, ya Ibni? What's the difference in the three different ways of addressing that I just gave an example of? And when you address your son in Arabic, for example, what's the context? What are the meanings that are different in relation to if I say, Ya Bunay, Ya Waladi, Ya Walid, Ya Ibni? What's the difference in the connotations, in the context, in the meaning of those three? Now, ah, mutaz. So, Bunay in the Arabic language is what they call a tasghir. Okay, a tasghir. It's a way of. Like to draw somebody in close to you, that you love him, you're showing affection, you're showing compassion to him. So Luqman in this verse, he joined the mo'idha, something which would normally make you cry, make you remember your mistakes, shortcomings, and, and deficiencies. And he joined it by attracting his son by saying what? Ya Bunay, my beloved son. That would be a good translation to it. My beloved son, my honorable son, my noble son, I love you. Come and listen to these words that I am going to advise you with. Okay? And the first thing that Luqman, he started with was what? The most dangerous thing for a Muslim. Which is what? What's the most dangerous, the most important thing for a Muslim to learn is what? Oneness of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the opposite of it is the most dangerous thing and most detrimental for the life and health of a Muslim is what? Shirk, associating partners with Allah. He prohibited his son. He says, listen to me, I'm going to give you a admonition. I'm going to give you an important reminder, my beloved son, come close to me. Come closely so that you can listen attentively. Do not associate partners with Allah. Do not associate partners of Allah Azza wa Jal. So what type of shirk is there? We know Tawheed, anytime we want to study a science in Islam, we should learn that science and delve into it deeply and get a firm understanding of it. And then if we want to understand it even more fully, then we should understand its opposite. So if we want to learn about Tawheed, we also need to study Shirk. In some of the khutbahs that have been presented here, you're learning about the Nawaqid of Al-Islam, right? The nullifiers of Islam, the nullifiers of the Shahada. You learned about the Shahada, right? But what about in the conditions of the Shahada, the seven conditions? Now what about the things which nullify? those conditions. Why do we want to learn about those things? So that we avoid them, we are weary of them, we're cautious of not falling into them, and that we stay far away from them. So, why didn't Luqman advise his son about Tawheed first? He advised him about Shirk. 
What could we extract from these verses? What would you say? Let's discuss the verses here. Get the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. Why didn't Luqman say to his son, "A'bud Allah," instead of saying "La tushrik billah"? Opposite. So he's kind of like warning from the dangerous things before he gives him maybe beneficial knowledge, you're saying, right? MashaAllah, that could, that's an excellent benefit that you extracted from that, MashaAllah. What else? So Luqman was granted what? Wisdom, right? We said the rats of wisdom, in, according to these verses, is being grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? Other forms of wisdom, we said wisdom needs to be based upon what? Knowledge. And if Luqman lived in the time of Dawood and Sulaiman in Jerusalem, then I'm sure he had knowledge of Tawheed. And I'm sure he was teaching his children about Tawheed. So now, Allah knows best, he was teaching his son the opposite of Tawheed because he, he knows his son already knows who Allah is, and that Allah needs to be worshipped alone. But now I want to give you a little bit more added benefits, added knowledge that just how you need to establish the tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal, you need to also be wary and cautious of something very dangerous as well which is shirk and falling into associating partners with Allah Azza wa Jal. So what type of shirk do we have in Islam? Shirk is of two types. We have the major shirk. What are some examples of major shirk? Okay, saying Allah has a son. What else? Again. Intermediary. Okay, what else? Supplicating to other than Allah, believing that that person has benefit or harm. Believing that anybody else has the characteristics of rububiyyah with Allah Azza wa Jal. Like Fir'aun. Anna rabbukum al-a'la. If anybody... I am God. I'm a God body. You ever hear those people? Arm, leg, leg, arm, head. <laughs> Allah. Akbar. Shirk al Akbar. Right? So, anybody who thinks that they are the Lord the Most High, okay, or associates the same attributes and characteristics and traits that are only befitting for Allah Azza wa Jal, creation, planning, at the dabbur Hiya and Mota, resurrecting, right, giving life, taking life, all of these are only specific for Allah. So knowledge of the unseen, believing that something or someone from the creation has knowledge of the unseen, this takes somebody out of the fold of Islam. So that's Shirk al-Akbar. So Shirk al-Akbar, the major Shirk, takes you out of the fold of Islam. What is the minor shirk? Shirk al askar huh? al showing off, or anything that may lead to the major shirk. For example, uh, for example, uh, swearing by other than Allah Azza wa Jal, or having a tamima or tamaa, okay, hanging an amulet or a talisman around my neck with, you know, verses of the Quran, thinking that that's going to protect my son and that Allah is not going to that that amulet or that talisman has the power to protect my children this in itself is not sure but it's what related to the belief that it can lead to somebody believing that somebody other than Allah has the benefit to remove harm or bring benefit so that's the minor shirk and as the brother mentioned shirk al-khafi okay shirk al-khafi which is the most inconspicuous type of shirk Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he said it's so inconspicuous, it's like a black ant on a black rock in a pitch black night. That's how inconspicuously it comes and sneaks up on you when you don't even realize it. Showing off, wanting the praise of the people. 
wanting to be said that you are generous. That's why you show off all your donations in the masjid or publicize them on Facebook or Twitter or things like this or making your prostrations nice and long and putting your arms out like this wide to your armpits showing so you want brothers to say mashallah the brother prays good that's all riya which is leading you to seek the praise of other than Allah Azza wa Jalla if you're seeking the praise of the creation so what happens if you get these intentions in your mind or heart it comes to us many times right that's our niya, our intention. Let's say the masjid called to raise some funds. And initially, when you heard the call to raise funds, it came to your heart, alhamdulillah, I'm going to give $10,000. And initially, your intention was sincere, that you want to give it for the sake of Allah. But then, shaitan came to you and whispered to you and said, now I want you to go in front of the masjid and show everybody that you're giving $10,000 so that the people can praise you and say that you're very generous. So what should you do at that moment before that money releases your hand? Rectify your intention. Rectify your intention. Before that money leaves your hand, make sure, okay, I'm giving it for Allah. Am I giving it for any other reason than the pleasure of Allah? Because what happens if you're giving it for Allah? Khalas. No reward at all from that $10,000 down the drain. If you were looking for to build up your bank account in the hereafter, that's why the righteous predecessors, they always used to say, Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah, he would say, Ma wajadtu shay'an ashiddu alayya min niyati. He says, I didn't find something more difficult upon myself than my niyya, li annaha tataqallabu alayya. Because it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing. I start off with a pure intention, but then Shaitan comes and gets me. Man. And he said, he was asked, well, what do you do if your knee changes? He says, stop. Don't perform the action. Rectify your intention. Make your knee solely for Allah Azza wa Jalla, and then continue and commence upon your, your deed. So shirk, brothers, is very, very serious. And this is why Luqman, the wise man, started off his advice with the most important thing, prior prioritizing the most important thing that a Muslim should know, especially the youth. How many examples of shirk do we see in our schools, in our societies, in our communities, just churches, right? Go around here. The cross. People don't worship Jesus, they worship the cross. Christians, right? A lot of them say, we worship the cross. We don't worship Jesus. Worshiping Jesus, who was Jesus? Was he a, a God or was he a man or a prophet or what? He was a prophet and a man. He wasn't the son of Allah Azza wa Jalla. But, right, people worship Buddhas, people worship statues, people worship idols, superstars, uh, trees, people worship, huh? People worship basketball players. Would that be an idol? What do we call them? Idols. People worship football players. People worship superstars, singers, dancers, entertainers, actors, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, they're not idols made of stone and clay and things like that, but you're idolizing them, glorifying them to a point where maybe sometimes you could have taken them to be someone equal or sharing in attributes and characteristics and traits like Allah Azza wa Jalla, may Allah protect all of us. So that's why it's very important that we awaken our children, awaken our youth to our surroundings. Like, hey, you may be idolizing an individual, even shuyukh, imams, scholars, same thing. You take their opinions, ijtihad opinions, over a statement of the Messenger sallallahu clear statement from the Prophet What have you done now? They've taken their, just like the Jews and the Christians did in the past, what did they do? They took their rabbis and their priests as their lords to be worshipped other than Allah. So when Adi ibn Hadim, he heard this hadith, he went to the messenger, or he heard the ayah, he went to the messenger and says, how did they used to worship? How did the people of the, the, the book used to worship their rabbis and pastors? 
Prophet Muhammad him, he says, they didn't used to worship them as you're thinking. He said, what they would do, they would make the haram things halal, and the halal things haram, and they would be obedient to them, and this was their worship of them. So, being obedient to somebody who orders you with disobedience to Allah, you've fallen into the same thing that the previous nations have fallen into. May Allah protect us all. So, should can negate all of one's actions. How? Because it's a nullifier of Tawheed. Did Allah Azza wa Jal even address the Prophet Muhammad about shirk? This will show us how dangerous it is. What did he say to the Prophet Muhammad? Allah Azza wa Jal showing us the severity and the, the terrible fate of anyone who falls into associating partners with Allah, he even addressed the Prophet Muhammad He said, La in ashrakta, if you, even my beloved Prophet, selected messenger, the best person on the face of the earth, the one who has sent revelation, the one who I entrusted with everything, even if you, oh my slave, Prophet Muhammad even if you associate partners with me, then all of your actions will be nullified and all of your actions will be void. And not only that, but you will be from amongst the losers. So if Allah Azza wa Jalla addressed the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in that manner, then what about us? Shouldn't we take it serious? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا قَبْلَ وَمَا بعد. Prophet was the one whose sins, his previous sins and past sins were forgiven. What about us? If Allah addressed the Prophet Muhammad in that way, shouldn't we take heed to that as well? And be wary and be cautious of associating partners with Allah and getting our beliefs right? Getting our knowledge of the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal right? So this is why Luqman, he started off with one of the most dangerous things that can remove somebody from the religion of Ibrahim, the religion of Dawood, the religion of Sulaiman, the religion of all the prophets and messengers, the religion of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which was all Islam. Inna dina inda Allahi, Islam. No other adyan, adyan. right? Some people say adyan, adyan is samawi and things like that. No, they don't say adyan is samawi. These are adyan muharrafa, right? Katabat aydihim, right? Yharrifun al karima an baad al wadi. No such thing. Only deen with Allah is who? With Islam. Deen with other people, yeah, and you can say all these other religions and things that people practice, but the only deen uh, that Allah Azza wa will accept from you is what? Is Al-Islam. As Allah he says in another verse, right? That the only deen that Allah accept from you is Al-Islam. If you don't accept it, then you will be from amongst the losers. So, uh, we have a principle in Usul, Usul al-Fiqh, and uh, is that warning from harmful things warning from harmful things should take precedence over encouraging or bringing about benefits in Arabic they would say dara al-mafasid muqaddim ala jalb al-maslaha keeping away harms Preventing harms takes precedence over bringing about benefits. So in this case here, let's say that, okay, well, Luqman's son didn't really know too much about Tawheed. So in his mind, in his eyes, the most dangerous thing that he needs to warn his son from is what? First, I'm going to warn him about the most dangerous thing that can make him enter the hellfire and never come out of it, which is shirk, before I want to adorn his mind and adorn his body and his enlightenment with tawheed, the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal, and increase him in understanding of who Allah is and why he needs to be worshipped. So from that aspect, right, and Allah Alam, I would say that the strongest opinion is the first one that we mentioned, that high probability, inshallah, that Luqman's son already knew about Allah Azza wa Jal, knew about tawheed, if he was living in the time of Dawood and Sulaiman 
or even if he was in Nubia at that time between Egypt and Sudan that he knew about the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal and he wanted to remind him about the harmful things to stay away from which was shirk. So one of the benefits that we we get from this first verse is that fathers need to take time to sit down with their children. Fathers need to take time out of their busy work schedules talk to them about Allah Azza wa Jal bring them to the masjid many of us we say oh you know, the kids don't come to the masjid all right well do their fathers come the kids learn more from observing their parents than they do from listening to their commands they say oh dad you tell me to go to the masjid you send me to tahfiz but you never come to tahfiz you tell me to go pray but you never come to pray in the masjid so children, especially at a young age, they learn more by example, by observation than they do by verbal, by they, they do by any other way. They're like sponges, right? They absorb everything that their parents teach them. And especially they mimic their actions, they mimic their ways, they mimic the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they carry themselves in the house. The way that they talk to their wife is sometimes you find that the children will talk to their mother the same way that their dad talks to their, their mother. Because they learn by observation. So the fathers, what we benefit from this is that we need to spend time with our children. Designate some time. Maybe half hour a day at the dinner table. Maybe after dinner you sit down and drink tea. Maybe at the masjid between Maghrib and Isha. Sit down and talk to them first and foremost about who is Allah. Why are you creating? What's your purpose in life? How do we worship Allah alone? What is Tawheed? What is the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jalla? What are the dangerous things that you need to be aware about in your community related to shirk? So Allah mentions the most important advice that parents should give to the children. Number one, worship Allah alone and avoid associating partners with Allah. Pray to Him alone, supplicate to Him alone, sacrifice for Him alone, fear Him alone. And then staying away from uh, the shirk. So what is the statement of Tawheed? La ilaha illallah. You want to learn about shirk, you have to learn about Tawheed and be reminded about Tawheed. We can never learn enough about La ilaha. If the Prophet Muhammad said in a hadith, are you guys familiar with the hadith of Bitaqa? The hadith of the card. Not a debit card, a credit card, or medical card. This card is heavy on the scales, brother. Who knows the hadith of Bitaqa? No? Relay it to us. So did you guys hear that or should I relay it again, inshallah? So the, the beautiful hadith, the hadith of the, the bitaqa is uh, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, he said there will be a man who will come with 99 scrolls. He will come on the day of judgment when it's the time for the weighing of good deeds and bad deeds. He will come with 99 scrolls of bad deeds and all of those scrolls will be piled up on one side of the scale. These Scrolls will be so much, so far that the eye can see and all it sees is nothing but these scrolls of bad deeds on this side of the scale. So Allah will ask him, well, were you wronged in this? Did you not do any of these things and, and, as such? And he says, no, this is, you know, these are all my deeds. These are all the things that I did. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will ask him, uh, do you have any good deeds? Do you have any good deeds that you can produce that you can put on the other side of the scale so he says I have this card so then he's thinking he's like well what good will this card do for me against all those those 99 scrolls of good deeds 
and Allah, I believe, he asked him, "Well, what is written on the uh, on the on the on the card?" And he says the word "La ilaha illallah." So then this card is placed on the other side of the scale, and it outweighs all of the 99 scrolls of bad deeds, and that shows us the virtue of the statement "La ilaha illallah." So "La ilaha illallah." What is the proper meaning of this statement? "La ilaha illallah." We have many different translations of this meaning. In Arabic, it should be understood, right? It doesn't mean لا خالق إلا الله. It means لا معبود بحق إلا الله. The word إلا comes from the word مألو. مألو معبود. That which you glorify, that which you deify, that which the heart relates to, and it goes up when it thinks about that. So, there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. Is it correct to come along and say that I understand that La ilaha illallah means La khaliq illallah? And what's the difference between La khaliq illallah and La ma'buda bi haqqan illallah? Any difference or they're the same? Any insight? Anyone want to try? So, لا خالق لله means no creator except Allah. لا معبود بحق إلا الله is that no one deserves to be worshipped except Allah. Are they the same? Are they different? And how are they similar or, or same in meaning? And what does that entail? If we believe one thing, and what does it entail if we believe the other thing? Yeah. Say Allah, no. Allah Akbar. I'm impressed with you, man. This brother, mashallah, he just accepted Islam. And he knows things that a lot of us don't know yet. And we've been Muslim for years. May Allah bless him and increase him in knowledge, increase him in goodness. Mashallah, community, pay attention to him. Get him ready. Maybe he goes overseas and studies or studies with scholars here and things like that. This is what we love to see, mashallah. So he, he pinned the tail on the donkey right there. Right? What did he say? He said, Allah Azza wa Jal, he talks about the, the disbelievers, the polytheists of Mecca, of Quraysh, in their time, in many verses in the Quran. Allah, he used to ask Quraysh, who created the heavens and the earth and everything in it? They will say, Allah. So they used to believe and bear witness that Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator. But they believed that the idols could get them closer to Allah. Zulfa. That worshipping these idols is kind of like a, a mediator. Like if a peasant wants to get to the king, he has to go through somebody who's close to the king, the servant of the king. So this is how they used to worship the idols. They would say, well, if I worship these idols, it's going to bring me closer to Allah. Azza wa Jal. So, لا معبود بحق إلا الله is that we single Allah out in worship, in prayer, in supplication, in dua, in khawf, in hub, in raja, in all of the things, the actions of worship. لا خالق إلا الله. There is no creator except Allah. You're only establishing that Allah is the Lord. Allah is the planner, Allah is the creator, but you're not establishing that Allah alone has the right to be worshipped. So this opens the doors for people to worship what? Other than Allah. When they understand La ilaha Allah to me, La khaliq Allah, that means, well, as long as I say and believe La ilaha Allah, which to them means there's no creator except Allah, then it's okay for me to go to worship this grave. It's okay for me to worship this saint. It's okay for me to believe that that sheikh has knowledge of the unseen. Do you understand the difference now? So, la ilaha illallah, la ma'abuda bi haqqin illallah. There's no deity worthy of worship except Allah Azza wa Jal.
And even the word ilah is different from khalik. So how do we manifest this statement into our actions and statements and behaviors? La ilaha illallah. In your heart first, then where? When you pray, you pray only to Allah. When you give zakat, you only give zakat for the sake of Allah. When you make hajj, you only make hajj for the sake of Allah. When you enjoin good and forbid evil, you only do it for the sake of Allah. When you're obedient to your parents, you're doing it first and foremost for the sake of Allah Azza wa When you uh, denounce the munkarat and denounceable things, you denounce them for the sake of Allah. When you fight jihad, you fight it for the sake of Allah. When you give charity, you do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. When you study knowledge, Islamic knowledge, religious knowledge, you should only do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. When you recite the Quran and memorize the Quran, you should only do it for the pleasure and the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal and for nobody else. Nobody else. So that's how we manifest okay, the shahada. What are the conditions of the shahada? Conditions of the shahada. Seven conditions of the shahada. So the, the shahada is like a key to enter into Jannah. But every key has what? Teeth. Every key has teeth. You can't just use any key and enter the Jannah, the key has to have the right teeth on it. The key maker has to make it so it will fit the lock to open the doors in paradise to you. So similarly, the Shahada has these conditions as well. Seven conditions that we must fulfill. Number one, knowledge of the Shahada, knowledge of its meaning. What it means, we just learned the proper meaning of it. Okay, and second, Yaqeen, have certainty and you have no doubt about it at all. I have no doubt at all that Allah, He is the creator, Allah is the planner, Allah is the sustainer, and He's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. He's the only one who deserves to be supplicated to. He's the only one who deserves to be sacrificed animals for. He's the only one who deserves to make hajj for the sake of nobody else. Have no doubts at all. And that's directly related to our aqidah. Because aqidah cannot be called aqidah if there is raib, if there is doubt in it. If there's doubt in your aqidah, and anything related to the six pillars of Iman, then it can't be called Aqidah. It's only be called speculation and hypotheses and things like this. So the Aqidah Islamiyah has no doubts, no misconceptions at all. Third, Al Qabul, you have to accept it. You have to accept it. Fourth, in Qiyad, you have to submit to it. Fifth, Sidq, truthfulness of it. Sixth, ikhlas, sincerity. And seventh, habba, you have to love it. So these are the seven conditions of the shahada. So, Luqman, in the first verse of his advice to his son, he says, if Luqman says to his son, and he is admonishing him, and scolding him, O oh, my dearly beloved son, do not associate partners with Allah. Indeed, associating partners with Allah is a great oppression. So Allah Azza wa Jal, when we look throughout the Quran and look throughout the Sunnah, we find that there are many verses that Allah advises us and recommends us to pay close attention to our children, to raise our children, to advise our children. You'll see from Allah fi awladikum. Allah instructs you concerning your children. Allah recommends you that you take care of your children, you fulfill their rights. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu, hu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your family from a blazing fire. This is a command from Allah Azza wa Jal. Imperative form. Plural form, all of you need to save your families from the hellfire. Save your families from the hellfire by educating them about Allah Azza wa Jal and warning them from the things that can harm them, which the most dangerous of them is shirk. And this is why Luqman started off with this for his advice to his son. So when we look in the Quran or in the Sunnah, what did the 
what was the, the tradition of the previous prophets and messengers and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in relation to children? How did he advise children? Did he ever mix with children or he was too busy? No, he's the, the, the chief of the believers, he's the head, he's the head of the, the army, he's the head of the state, he meets the different wafood coming from different places across the world, he has multiple wives, he has children, he's receiving revelation. So was the Prophet Muhammad Sassam so busy that he didn't get to spend time with the youth or the youngins or the children? Like many of us are today, oh, I'm busy, I'm busy. You know, your wife calls you, hey, come take your son, bring him to the message. Oh, I'm busy, I'm busy. You're not one-tenth as busy as the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was. Don't lie to yourself, brother. And you only got one wife. How did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu nurture and train the youth? Did he spend time with them? How did he do it? What are some examples? We have many examples from the Sunnah of the Messenger When Umm Salama came and gave Anas as a gift to the Messenger وسلم, as a servant, she says, I have nothing to, when the Prophet Muhammad said, migrated from Mecca to Medina, she didn't have anything to give him. She says, I give my son to you as a servant to you, to help you, to aid you, to benefit from you. And Anas ibn Malik was one of the, the closest companions to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who benefited from him on his journeys in his household, knew all the ins and outs of what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in his house. So how, how did he deal with Anas? How did he deal with many of the younger companions? For example, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. What did he, what were some of the words or some of the trips that he would take them on? There's many hadith. One of the hadith is that on one occasion, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and young Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was most likely between the ages of 13 to 16, during that time, he had Abdullah ibn Abbas riding on the back of a donkey with him. And he, he told him, he addressed him, he says, Ya ghulam. What is a ghulam? Young child, young boy. Indeed, I am going to teach you some very important words. Preserve Allah and be mindful of Allah and Allah will preserve you. If you are mindful of Allah, then anywhere you go in your dunya, Throughout your day, throughout your night, you will find Allah Azza wa Jal there to protect you, there to preserve you. Either sta'anta, fasta'in billah. Very simple uslub that even a young child could understand. It wasn't complicated or complex and things like that. He talked to the youth in a way that they could understand and they could relate to. If you ask aid, then first ask Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you ask, ask Allah. Then until the end of the hadith, if the whole ummah, if the whole world is gathered against you, then know that they cannot harm you except if Allah wills. And know if the whole world is gathered with you to aid you, then know that they cannot aid you except with Allah Azza wa He was giving Abdullah ibn Abbas practical examples that he could relate to. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he saw many groups of the companions together and what probably came to his mind when the Prophet Muhammad told him that hadith was, wow, all these people, imagine, were all on my side, but Allah didn't want, they couldn't benefit me. So he was giving him practical, simple examples that he could relate to at that young age. On another occasion, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who was also from the youth at that time, he was riding on the donkey with the Prophet Muhammad those, those, This was a regular practice. Prophet Muhammad would take the youth with him on trips, take the youth with him on journeys. The youth would accompany their fathers and mothers on maybe in the marketplace, in the souq, in business transactions and things like this. How many of us now, we don't let our kids come with them and say, oh, it's Abe, it's not a nice place to sit and things like that. And this is why we see the difference 
in our kids today compared to the difference that we see how our grandfathers and fathers were raised and things like that. They benefited. Their fathers would take them everywhere. Hey, go to the market, buy me some lettuce, buy me some cucumbers, you know, uh, go buy some fabric from this one. When they would interact with the elders, they would sit. It wouldn't be a separate room. Fortunately, a lot of times the culture and the adat take over the, the teachings of Islam, you know. In many cultures, you'll find they'll sit the young kids in a room by themselves and the adults will sit all together. No. How are the young men going to learn? How are they going to learn how to talk, how to sit, how to have eye contact, how to get up for somebody who's elder than them, how to have respect and things like this? It all comes from observation. Children... They learn from observation first and foremost in regards to their parents, what they get them and what. So that was the way the Messenger وسلم, would teach Japan. He would take them on journeys, keep them close to him, yeah? and they would benefit not only from his manners and etiquette, also his statements and his actions. And this is why many of these great companions at a young age benefited so much from the Messenger وسلم, because of that companionship, because of that accompaniment. So that brings us to the importance of sending our kids to the masajid. Putting them in wholesome, pure environments where they can benefit from the imam, benefit from the, the scholar, benefit from the sheikh. See his manners, see his etiquette, to see how he talks, see how he walks, see how he prays. So, Luqman, he started off just like all the other prophets and messengers would do with affectionate, passionate advice, punishment for his, for his son. So, children are born upon the fitrah. Children, all human beings, they're born upon the fitrah. What is the fitrah? Natural disposition, natural inclination. So, every human being that's born, what are they born? What's, what's the proof and evidence that every human being that's born is born a Muslim? Any proof, any evidence from the Quran, from the Sunnah? It's a hadith right there. Alright? No, that's one. Anything from the Sunnah? Kullu mawludan. Yuzu da da fitra. Fa abawaho. Yehowidano. Au yunasirano. Au yumajisano. The proof that every human being is born upon the fitra, upon Islam, upon the state of submission to Allah, is this hadith of the Messenger وسلم, where he says, Every child is born upon the fitrah. But his parents either make him a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian, a fire worshiper. As an animal delivers a perfect baby, do you find any of them, them mutilated? So the proof that everyone is born upon Islam is that the fitrah is Islam and then they change them from their pure state. They change them from their pure state of submission to Allah Azza wa So if they weren't born Muslim, then it would say that they would parents would change them into Muslims. But here we know that the foundation, the fundamental, the basis that every human being is born upon is, is Islam, is in a state of submission to Allah Azza wa Even all the creatures, they're what? In a state of submission. Taw'an. They don't have a free will. Birds, animals, insects, fish, trees, grass, plants. They don't have a free will. Frogs. They're all making the praise of Allah in a way that Allah created, in the way that Allah, Allah knows best. But we don't understand. Allah understands it, but we don't understand it. Allah says it. But human beings, they have a free will to choose what we want to follow, what we want to practice, what we want to implement. 
So, what is intended by the fitrah is that all human beings are born upon Islam. So they can either remain upon that fitrah, upon that state of submission throughout their life, if they're put in what? A positive, pure, wholesome environment. If their parents raise them to remain upon that fitrah, their parents don't get them baptized, their parents don't get them, uh, you know, dunked in the holy water, or whatever they do, right, in the churches and things like this, or the christening, or what other practices do they have from different religions and things like this. In the Amish culture, the faith, what they do once the person reaches the age of puberty, they let the person pick. You've reached the age of puberty, do you want to be down with our Amish beliefs and way of life or not? You can either go out to the world, the secular world, and have a job and things like this, or stay in our community and be considered amongst our community and not be shunned and boycotted. And things like this. But Islam, we don't have to do nothing. All we have to do is raise them upon the fitrah. Keep teaching them what Allah Azza wa Jal told us to teach them and train them in a way that they should be trained. So we have about one minute left, alhamdulillah. So we've digested, alhamdulillah, the first verse of the advice of Luqman to his son. So what can we summarize very quickly that we can learn from that first verse? Number one, it's very important for fathers and parents to regularly admonish and remind their children in an affectionate way that will draw them attention and draw them closer to them. Secondly, what else can we learn? When you want to advise your children and teach your children, always prioritize and start off with the most important things. First, warn them from the things which are detrimental and harmful for them before you give them things which will benefit from them. Make sure that they are free and clear of all the things that will harm them and cause uh, bad things for them and evil for them. What else can we learn from the first verse? Shukr Dhulm al We learned the explanation of the greatest type of dhulm. The greatest type of oppression is what? Falling into shirk, falling into associating partners with Allah. What else from the first verse? Huh? Gratitude, mashallah, tabarakallah. Right? That was even the one before that, the twelfth verse. Right? That Luqman was given hikmah, and one of the first things that he was taught in relation to hikmah was to be grateful and to be appreciative to Allah Azza wa Jal. لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ فَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you give thanks to Allah and are grateful to Allah, then Allah will increase you. What else? Any other benefits that we can extract from this first verse? So this is what we're doing. This is what the Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith. يَتَدَارَسُونَهُ فِي مَا بَيْنَهُ Probably he said in the hadith, that the angels will come and attend the gathering, mercy will descend upon us, tranquility and peace will descend upon us. Our names will be mentioned in the heavens when we do this with the Quran. We discuss and contemplate and reflect over the meanings of the Quran. That is mudarasa. Right? It's a difference between reading. I'm just reading. Nobody's giving input, but input. But mudarasa is we it's a discussion, it benefits. Right? benefit from each other because there might be one benefit or two benefits that the brothers here can extract from the verses that we haven't come across yet. What else? Any other benefits that we can do before we sum up? No? So, bi-idhnillah, uh, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to inshallah accept inshallah what we put forward tonight, what we conveyed inshallah and bi-idhnillah we will commence tomorrow, uh, Jamali, tomorrow what time? Tomorrow we will commence after Salat al-Dhuhr. We'll be going in a little bit more deeper. We're going to take the third verse, the second verse of Luqman's advice to his son. And try to extract a little bit more benefits about um, some reminders for our parents about our children. What are some traits of good parents? What are some traits of good children? What are the rights parents have over children? What are the rights children have over parents? These are all going to come within these beautiful advices that Luqman gave to his son. So, inshallah, make sure everybody, when is dinner? Right after Aisha. 
So I know we smelled the delicious food. May Allah bless all of the sisters for all of their hard work. They've been here since yesterday cooking. May Allah increase them in goodness, inshallah, and reward them greatly. So inshallah, we'll pray Isha, and uh, inshallah now we will, we will end for today's session. Hopefully what we heard was beneficial. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه هو غفور رحيم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك الشنو لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استوى تريب لنا جالس ودك وشور وشور استوى الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت شاء اتخذ الى ربه ما
سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ألهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علما يقين لا ترون الجحيم ثم لا ترونها عين اليقين ثم لا تسالون سمي الله لمن حمده
الله أكبر الله سمي الله لمن حمده أكبر الله سمي الله لمن حمده Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah ta'ala, the brothers and sisters, prior to uh, consuming our meal, it is the season for a cold and flu. 
So inshallah ta'ala, prior to going into the activity room, please brothers and sisters, wash your hands. And no, using hand sanitizer is not, a effect, not an effective means of washing your hands. So inshallah ta'ala again, prior to uh, consuming the meal, please wash your hands. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. So be, be, before we get seated, reminder that tomorrow, as Sheikh Farouk mentioned about uh, the second lesson being after Salat al-Zuhr, and then the third lesson being after Salat al-Maghrib. So after Salat al-Zuhr and after Salat al-Maghrib. Uh, tomorrow, for tomorrow. Sunday, we, we discuss Sunday, tomorrow, <laughs> Saturday. Uh, so again, after Salat al-Zuhr, tomorrow, and lesson number three will be after Salat al-Maghrib. Now, once we um, finish the lesson tomorrow evening, as mentioned on our flight, we will have the youth sleepover. So in regards to the youth sleepover, again, the rules that apply is that the children that are age 13 or older, they can come without their parents. The children that are under the age of 13, they must be accompanied with their parents. So if you have children that are younger than the age of 13 and you bring them to the sleepover tomorrow, please come along with them. Any of the children uh, that are gonna be sleeping overnight, make sure they have sleeping bags. For those who have accidents in the bed, make sure we have a means of you know, protecting the carpet from being wet from you know, their accidents, so on and so forth. Um, also, we want the community to, if I could just have you guys' attention, inshallah, just a little bit. For those people who are bringing their children tomorrow, if you can please donate that which you can donate, whether it be money, whether it be boxes of chips, whether it be boxes of juices, cookies, any type of snacks, popcorn, things of this nature for the children to have things to snack on in the evening. Barakallahu feekum. So again, we'll see you guys tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. And regarding the food, we want to do this based off of honesty, an honesty system, inshallah. Those who actually went online to eventbrite.com and they actually register a free ticket. They register a free ticket. If you could please go ahead and proceed for the men to the activity room, those who got an admission online, proceed to the activity room. Those sisters, they could go ahead and proceed to the seating area in the back of the men's musalla. After they are seated, then everyone else who didn't reserve a ticket can go ahead and proceed to the activity room for the men and the back of the musalla for, uh, of the men's musalla for the women. Barakallahu feekum. We hope that you guys will be honest in this situation. And inshallah, we will soon eat. Yes, I saw your name.